Good morning. Welcome to our latest in installment of the pandemic in policy, practice and politics. And today this is a very it's a very special conversation. I'd say it's also kind of a personal personal one for me because we are going to talk about challenges facing working women, COVID-19 and beyond. We're joined today by Dr. Susan McElroy, who has been has been studying these issues for quite a while, and I'm very, very interested in hearing what she has to say. Dr. McElroy. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be your speaker today for the pandemic policy and practice series at uh, School of Economic and Political and Policy Sciences. And we will get started. Today, our topic of discussion is Challenges Facing work and Working Women, COVID-19 and Beyond. This is a timely topic because we know that COVID-19, the, the global pandemic in which we find ourselves, our country and the rest of the world has changed so many things. So we begin a view of women in the workforce with a backdrop of COVID-19. The main points of today's presentation, I want to start off by just summarizing those so you have an idea where we're going. The most important thing I would want you to remember today from the presentation is that the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and actually deepened or exacerbated many gender inequalities in the US workforce meaning those gender inequalities were there before the COVID-19 global pandemic. And I'll explain as we go through the presentation what I mean by that. It's also true that women have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 COVID economic downturn. Finally, women of color face unique challenges in the workforce and women's position through the pandemic as it relates to work has highlighted that issue as well. Next slide. Working women face a number of challenges in advancing their careers, in balancing family and work responsibilities. And so we can think in terms of the types of jobs that women are more likely to hold, in some cases being a challenge in and of themselves. Women are overly represented. When I say overly represented, we can think in terms of women as a percentage of the population, women, women as a percentage of the labor force, but these are occupations that tend to be dominated by women. Examples, caretakers, childcare workers, elementary school teachers, retail. Those are also generally lower paying jobs. The fact that women tend to be in those types of low paying jobs has a lot to do with what we call the gender disparity in pay. Now this presentation is not about the gender gap in pay, but the gender gap and women's wages themselves are present a challenge for working women. So we wanna make sure that we recognize that from the outset. Also, there are specific barriers for women to reach jobs that pay more than some of those lower paying jobs that we mentioned in the first bullet point. The US economy, as a result of the global pandemic, has tanked. I would like to put a pretty picture, like to put a pretty face on that, but it's just not possible to do that. Our economy has drifted downward deeper and faster than it ever has in, in the history of our country. So what am I talking about? What are some of those key labor force indicators that help us understand how bad the pandemic economy has been and how major the changes are? Well, the number of people employed has gone down. The number of persons unemployed has gone up. The unemployment rate has gone up. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Next slide. Mm -hmm. 
the previous statistics that I cited are data that come from having men and women, as we say sometimes in the vernacular in statistics, lumped together, right? In other words, we haven't disaggregated to see what is different, what's going on with men and what's going on with women, because we first need to have a sense of what is happening at an overall level to the economy. And that's what the last slide tells us. But now when we look at men and women broken down separately, here's what we want to do. We want to take the most recent, most current data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is for February 2021, literally hot off the press data released last Friday in the jobs report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So we're going to take that February 2021 data and we're going to go back a year to see what was happening about a year ago. And this is roughly a comparison that we could think of as pre-pandemic and pandemic. OK, so what do we see in this slide? We see that for both men and women, unemployment rates went up. We also see that regardless of whether we're talking about a year ago or now in the pandemic, we see some important gender differences. OK, next slide. OK, labor force participation. For those of you who might not look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics data as often as I do, let me just remind you, labor force participation is about what percent of the population is actually in the labor force. And so when we compare men and women, we expect to see that a greater percentage of the men in the population are actually in the labor force, hence their higher labor force participation rates. Now, what is really important to see in this slide is not only that men tend to have higher labor force participation rates, regardless of whether we're pre-pandemic or now, but also that for both men and women, labor force participation rates went down over the past year. Next slide. It's also important that we highlight the reality that many of the gender inequalities that the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted or show a, a, a light was, we could think about the light uh, helped us see better some gender inequalities that were already there. Much in the same way that Hurricane Katrina exposed poverty, urban poverty specifically. What were some of those pre-existing gender inequalities? And I chose that word pre-existing very carefully. I chose it partly because it, it harkens back to the notion that uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, we've heard a lot about pre-existing conditions because individuals who had pre-existing health conditions clearly did much worse with COVID-19. And the reason why that's important is that if it was diabetes, if it was obesity, if it was high blood pressure, COVID-19 did not cause it. But when COVID-19 hit like a ton of bricks, it made everything not only more visible, but in fact worse. OK, so what are some of those pre-existing gender inequalities? Women and men do different types of work in the U.S. labor force in many, many ways. And that's important because it tends to be connected to pay. Women are concentrated in certain occupations. Men are concentrated in certain occupations. In other words, there, there are a lot of occupations that are uh, primarily or predominantly uh, men, others that are predominantly women. We, we notice that many of the predominantly male occupations pay uh, more than the predominantly female occupations. And let me be clear, I'm not making a case that low paying occupations that are female dominated are low paying because they are female dominated. Sorting out all of that, is not a task that we want to take on today. But here's what's important to know, that in fact, women are concentrated in those low paying service occupations often are held by women. And that's part of the gender gap in pay, not only pay, but compensation in terms of benefits. 
Next slide. Okay, this is a really important slide here. Let me try to make it as clear as I can what my point is here. A couple of things. The graph shows unemployment rates of women broken down by race. Now, what it also does is again, give us that year ago, a year back in time view. All right, so what do we see? We see that across race, black, Hispanic, and white women, there is a considerable increase or uptick in unemployment, which makes sense because it, for the economy as a whole, there was an incredible uh, spike in unemployment. And this is just reflecting that across these three race gender groups. Now, you could ask, why don't you have Asian women there? And the reason I don't is because we don't yet have enough data to show Asian women's unemployment rates separately. So Asians are Asian men and women together. Now, here's the other important point about this slide. It is that if you notice, the unemployment rate of white women that increased between 20, February 2020 and February 2021, as of the pandemic most recent date, white women's unemployment rate was around 5%. That 5% looks very similar to the unemployment rate of Black and Hispanic women pre-pandemic. That's really important. And why is it important? Because it shows the differing positions of women according to their race in the labor market by one indicator, which is unemployment, right? I might also mention that traditionally the black unemployment rate has trended at about twice as high as the white unemployment rate. In fact, that's, that is um, so well known by labor economists that we really think about that like a stylized fact. It's just something that people sort of know and they expect to see. Okay, let's go to the next slide. How has the global pandemic economic downturn or the pandemic recession been different for women from the recession that happened in 2008 and 09? The answer is very, very different and here's how. Women in those female dominated occupations and industries in which there are a lot of women working like the hospitality industry, those are the industries that got hit the hardest in this recession. The pan I'm gonna call it the pandemic recession. Back in 2008-09, that recession actually hit construction and manufacturing the hardest. And those are uh, occupations, those are industries and, and occupations to some degree that are that tend to be uh, tend to be male dominated. Okay, so so that's part of the reason why we see higher unemployment and greater job loss among women in this recession as compared to 2008 and 2009. The other distinguishing factor about the current recession as compared to that 2008-09 period is the change to remote work and remote school, which has turned just about everybody's life upside down in more ways than one. But who has, who has been impacted the most? It appears to be, in terms of workers, it appears to be women. Okay, so childcare arrangements and many other arrangements had to be made, such as figuring out how to get your own work done and take care of children at the same time. Right? Now, I want to be clear, I'm not making an assumption that women are doing all the child care and child rearing. Right? But it appears from what we know that women have been, in many cases, the one who was charged with the task of figuring out how are we gonna make this work? Okay, so when I say that the pandemic disproportionately has affected women in terms of their work, what do I mean? Well, there's been more job loss among women. The low paying service occupations have been hit very hard and there are a lot of women in those types of jobs. 
Certain industries, as I mentioned previously, have also been affected greatly, one of those being the hospitality industry. But instead of just taking a broad view of each industry and asking how are women affected, we need to look inside those industries and see the types of jobs that women have and men have. And when we do that, we're gonna see some pretty critical differences such as in the hospitality industry, housekeepers, predominantly female. That's a low paying, uh, usually no benefits service occupation. The managers, that's the catering managers, the accounting managers are predominantly male. And so who's gonna be the first to let go? It tends to be those employed in the low paying, low skill service occupations or jobs who are women. Finally, the pandemic has disproportionately affected women economically because women still carry the bulk of responsibilities for certain tasks, including childcare, managing the household, and taking care of aging parents. Next slide, please. All right, this, this table is just to give you a sense of how many people are we really talking about here when we talk about job loss. We're talking about, for women, we're talking about a decrease of 4.3 million jobs. For men, a decrease of 4 million jobs over that year long period from February 2020 to February 2021. So you can see the numbers are higher for men, but the actual loss of jobs is higher for women. Next slide. We also want to spend just a few minutes talking about some of the specific challenges facing women of color in the labor market. Some of those challenges, which again, were pre-existing, that existed before the COVID-19 pandemic, they've been brought to light. And we just wanna highlight some of those challenges. One of them is many women of color work in occupations with heavy contact with the public that are low skill and low pay, which I've already talked about. Women of color are also disproportionately represented in government, public sector, and education jobs. Disproportionately represented doesn't mean that it's a negative to work for the government or to work for the public sector, have an ed a job in, in education. But what's important is, what are the economic implications of that for women's position? That's really what we wanna know. And we all know the shape in which public schools are now as a result of the pandemic. Very difficult situations. The administrators are having to solve some very, very challenging problems. Also, women of color get hit with what I call a double whammy, gender and race disparity. That's pay. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about pay, and we're also talking about the types of jobs and the opportunities for advancement in those jobs. Finally, it's, it's, it's unlikely that many women of color have the type of jobs, specifically professions, I could say, where they're able to work from home and be fully compensated. In other words, once the work gets transferred to the home, the most important thing I'm talking about here is that you still get paid and you still get paid the same. Next slide, please. So many women of color find themselves in what we call permanent part-time work. Not only women of color, but women of color specifically have to face this challenge in many, many situations. They would rather have a full-time job but often part-time work is all they can find. It's also a known fact that employers will hire workers and then limit their hours to just below full-time to avoid paying benefits. So you end up with a situation where many women of color may have two jobs, both part-time and still don't have benefits. That's what we're talking about with permanent part-time work. Next slide. 
So what are the key takeaways? What would I hope that you might remember if you thought about this presentation, let's say two days from now? One is that the pandemic did not create these gender inequalities in the workforce, but in many cases has deepened those inequalities and widened gaps such as pay gaps, gaps in benefits, gaps in employment, differences in unemployment. The challenges that many working women face, they already faced prior to the pandemic. On top of the existing challenges, now has been added the challenge of working from home, homeschooling children, online work for both children and parents. All of that combined has created difficult decisions as well as some very high stress levels. So as the economy adapts to a new normal, the pandemic will introduce some new opportunities. In other words, the news is not all bad. Entrepreneurs are busy figuring out how to provide niche services and products that didn't even exist two, five years ago. And that's a positive story to be told. Finally, where do we go from here? Well, in terms of research, which is usually what we professors tend to think of, it's going to be important that we pay attention and understand precisely how COVID-19 has impacted the workforce and particular groups in the workforce. So that in the future, when similar events, heaven forbid, should happen, as we've been told that they will, that we'll be better prepared to have some security around job retention and the strength of the economy. I mentioned new industries and new job opportunities, so bullet points two and three are positive stories. Finally, addressing barriers, both natural and unnatural, to improving women's position in the workforce are important on a level of, as we said, practice and public policy. So I hope that you've enjoyed the presentation I made today and we're gonna to move to the next section of the presentation. I wanna thank you again for the invitation to be your speaker today. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Dr. McElroy. I think, you know, at least I, I know we have a few questions that have already popped up in the in the chat. And, and also, you know, I, I'm just thinking one of the questions is talking about what kind of, of policy interventions can we do to to lessen this impact? And I guess I guess we could look at them long term and short term policies, because I think, you know, we all want everyone to be as productive and successful as they're as they can. Right. So, you know, I think if we're going to have a fully functional and, and robust economy, we really want to make sure people don't stall. So so what what do you think a good policy short and long term policy uh, collection could could possibly be used to keep women from stalling, especially during pandemics and maybe overall keep them from stalling? That's a really good question, Dean Holmes. And I would say that the easiest question to answer is long term. And the types of investments that we need to make are investments in not just infrastructure, but investments in education, investments in uh, preparing the next generation of, of doctors, of healthcare professionals, for example. Making sure that if it's networks, if it's academic preparation, whatever's required, that there's a path for women to get to those occupations that have good benefits, that, that have pay, that, that have higher pay. Um, that's a long-term investment. The more short-term investments often uh, center around solutions that are really pretty straightforward, like, like helping women with transportation issues, helping women with housing issues. What about, uh, what about childcare? I mean, I know, you know, 
so many daycares shut down during the pandemic. And I think some are starting to open up now a bit more than before. But then you had women who were trying to work remotely if they were lucky enough and then had had these kids they had to help, you know, help with their schoolwork if they had school age children. This is something, you know, I know I had a time in my life when when I was a single parent and I had a toddler, but thank goodness I didn't have to deal with a pandemic. And I had I had grandparents nearby who were incredibly supportive, but not everyone has that family support they can use on and then this push to kind of remote school a lot of school-aged kids on at the same time that daycares were not open right. the child care issue is definitely a really important issue for working women and what i would hope is that as we move into the future and prepare ourselves better for other pandemics or other types of major changes uh, that will cause life to be <laughs> redesigned, if you will, like the pandemic has done, that we would focus on child care as number one, as an investment in children. And secondly, as a family issue, as opposed to a women's issue. Now that doesn't say what the policy should look like, right? But we have to deal with some tough realities such as Good child care is costly, and there's no way around it, right? There's there's no way around it. Um, as you know, I have a daughter, and when she was in daycare, she was at a daycare center that was part of a university, right? So I knew at the time that she had access, or we had access, to very high-quality daycare. And even at a professor's income, it was expensive, okay? And so the government... Uh, the public sector uh, maybe needs to change the view about child care, not as babysitting, but as the beginning of children's education. We can you know, get people to think about it like that. We might be able to develop a system that will help children get off to a better start. You know, I'm reminded of, I, I remember reading when there was a shortage of nurses that hospitals said, oh boy, we need to actually have on-site daycare, including daycare that will take sick kids. I mean, not horribly sick, but you know, if you have a fever, right. like kids get sick in daycare, right? <laughs> uh, they get sick in school. Um, and, and so a lot of hospitals kind of set up their own daycare systems for healthy and kids with little, you know, sniffles and, and the rest because most of their nurses were women and most of their nurses were, were parents and they knew if they could provide this support, they would get more nurses. They wouldn't have the nurses shortage, right? So that's kind of a market or a private response to this problem. But you're right, maybe there's some, some other broader solutions out there. It's it's very I, I like the reframing of it as being an investment in human capital, right? And in, in family. Absolutely. And one of the places that we might start is with I can think of two places that we could start. One is with the pay of child care workers. Because child care is not viewed as an investment. Very little training is required, and sometimes even the certifications that's re that are required aren't really enforced. Well, so that's not really in the benefit of that's not really in the benefit of, of children. So starting with the pay of child care workers would be a good place to start. And the other would be raising the level of of expectation and the level of quality, you know, put simply of child care facilities that they're required to, you know, have cleanliness up to a level, nutrition up to a certain level, making sure there's some educational activity going on. You know, this is doable. The will has to be there and probably some of the changes will be costly, but others just require using the available resources that we have differently. Absolutely. I mean, I remember my son was very fortunate and when he was in daycare, his teacher was actually like certified as a kindergarten teacher. So it's like he <clears> did 
kindergarten twice, even though the first time was just in the context of daycare. So when he actually went to kindergarten, he was he was ready, right? And he, ready, was, ready. He, was, he was ready, ready. He was reading all the Harry Potters in first grade, like read all of them in first grade. And, you know, of course, I would love to take personal credit for it. But I think it I think a lot of it is that daycare basically was like private kindergarten that year it really got him started. Now, one of the questions from the audience is making an observation, and I guess the, 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 the person is asking if there's a relationship, maybe causal. So there's the observation that the U.S. birth rate is falling, and it's at the, in 20, before the pandemic even, it was, it was well below the 2.1 replacement. And I guess there, this, this, this participant is asking if we think that trend of declining birth rates is related to less support for women, um, you know, either once they're in the workplace or, or helping them, you know, progress. I probably wouldn't make an argument that the declining birth rate is due to uh, lack of the type of support that you were that you were referring to, although there could certainly be individual women who have made choices about having children or the age at which they have children, how many children or families, I should say, have made decisions that are based in part on the availability of support or lack thereof. So I certainly think it's important. I don't know that I don't know that I'd be ready to build an economic model, if you will, around the availability of support linking to the birth rate, right? But let me make another point that's really important about women and fertility and childbearing decisions. All women are not the same. Of course, you knew that. You knew that before you came to the presentation today. What I mean by that is there are different trajectories, if you will, that women are on in terms of their education, in terms of marriage, in terms of childbearing. And so, for example, when you look at women who begin uh, childbearing in their teens, they're on a different life trajectory, if you will, from women who delay childbearing primarily because they want to finish their education, they want to graduate from high school, they want to go to college, perhaps even graduate school. Now, why am I talking about education as it relates to these birth rates? Because until we understand that there is a range of decisions that people make in terms of their lives that impact the quality of their life as they go through and as they age, and then the quality of their children's lives, we need a more holistic view that says educational choices affect labor market choices, vice versa, <laughs> right? Absolutely. And on board, it would be the arrows are going every which way, right? And so, Yes, designing policy that recognizes that is not going to be simple. But until we have a more holistic view that says, yes, women who view themselves as not having many opportunities in terms of education, in terms of uh, employment, that impacts the decisions that they make around childbearing, right? So that until we better understand those women-focused decision processes a little bit better, we need to understand those decision processes better so that they can guide public policy. And so one of the important changes that we do need to see happen is in the research world that even if you think about just the medical side, the fact that we still have so many uh, clinical trials and mm -hmm. different types of medical research that are limited to men in this country is appalling. Now, we wanna keep it from being political, but let me just put it in economic terms. We need to understand how health 
Decisions matter. We need to better understand the effectiveness of different types of drugs. We need to understand how different behavioral choices impact people's health, all of that. And it's at least as important to understand it for women as it is for men. And I want to be clear again, I'm not making a case that women are more important, but we need to be brought to the table and our physical, mental health needs to be put on the same level as that of our male counterparts because we're part of the population too not to mention taxpayers okay so yeah absolutely and you know i i, I think i just read and it's early right i mean we're a year into the pandemic where, where we shut down but i remember back in 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 march everyone was snickering saying oh there's going to be a big baby boom right but it turns out that there's been a baby bust like we we are in in as as university educators we're going to see a dip in college age kids in 18 years now what what i don't know and i don't think anyone can can say for certain are we going to see kind of a okay so there was a pause and then we get a bump to make up for for the babies that that weren't weren't born um that year because people delayed for whatever reason I mean, there's certainly a lot of stress uh, that people went through and right. lots of financial uncertainty that that um could make people postpone i mean i know personally i always expected to have two kids and in fact my older sisters are triplets so i thought i thought <laughs> i thought i might have them all at once right just <laughs> given my family history but i only had one and you know that was not my intent but life got complicated and um you know so i think a, a lot of uh, you know if you lose that opportunity you just might not go back either because you're aging out of of the age at which you can easily have a, a child or that your personal circumstances change or work responsibilities become different. Uh, so I know, you know, for me, as I said, hey, I, you know, I, this is this is a I, I this is a great topic. I have a lot of interest because I lived through some of these these challenges. Now, granted, I was very fortunate, right? I I had my son had grandparents close by. I, I had a job. I waited. I was at the, the office the night before I was induced finishing my first book manuscript to send to the publisher. Right. So I I had a, I had a lot of benefit. I was I was in a very fortunate position even with the disruption. And that's not not a level of support or security that a lot of women have. And that's why, I, you know, I I look at this topic with great concern because I, I just fear this could be a disruption that's so hard to have some women recover from. I think that's right. I think I think that's absolutely right. And I think that while we are privileged as professional college degreed women in um, the in, in academia in the occupation of, of a professor, uh, which is even different in terms of the um, day to day activities, very different from elementary and secondary uh, school teaching. But the ways in which women at higher levels of education and different types of professions have certain supports, at least we hope they do, right? Those don't have to be reserved for professional women. They don't have to be reserved for college professors. They don't have to be reserved for women who, if the workplaces are willing to or people in the workplaces, management, willing to consider doing some things differently, at least open to trying different alternatives. That's going to take us a long way, right? So I think of a, a totally unrelated example, which is the training of workers for the new, for the, for the green economy. Right. During the time I lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, before I moved back to Dallas, that region of the country was really struggling with how do we move forward from the steel economy to the new economy, which for them is educate primarily education and healthcare. How this is relevant is that they were trying to figure out how do we pull out 
the key pieces of training for retrofitting homes for new technology. In other words, is there a way that people might be trained to do this without having to go through a long year, you know, many, many years of training similar to becoming a plumber? That's a really kind of interesting idea if you think about it. It doesn't devalue the long term type of training, but it says maybe there are ways that we can figure out how to pull out critical skills and put them together in a way that will allow individuals to be trained for higher skilled, higher paying occupations without necessarily going to college, without even necessarily getting an associate's degree, right? In other words, different thinking differently about the educational and training process is also going to be really important as we move forward. That's a way to create new opportunities, not just for women, but really for everyone, right? This is what this is what I like about the, you know, despite this being a very tough topic, there there's some opportunities here, right? And so you you do have these optimistic hopes, I think. One one thing I love along those lines, you know, universities are being challenged by Google. Google's starting to do these little certificates, right? So we have our graduate certificates that are more skill based where you don't have to get a master's degree. Um, but others, you're right, others are new actors are coming in and saying, hey, what if you just need the skill, come get it from us as opposed to a university. Um, so that 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 that's might be a big disruptor for us. Yeah, that's some competition. <laughs> yeah, which, you know, we are actually we're we're trying to expand our, our certificate options along those lines precisely in response to that demand. Uh, but, you know, I, I know a lot of us will continue using Instacart or some other grocery delivery. Right. Whether or not that's a pandemic, it's kind of nice not to have to go to the grocery store. I mean, I kind of like it. It's an escape sometimes, but yeah. Um, geez, if you don't, if you're tight on time, it's nice to have your groceries delivered. And, you know, that just wasn't a service that was open a lot. Of course, you have to be able to pay for it. It's not horribly expensive, but if you're already on the margins, yeah, you're probably not right. going to have that as a, as a, as an option. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, even, even in university teaching, I think there are going to be some changes that we're going to want to keep. Uh, I, I never did online testing because I'm, you know, I'm kind of old school and I like to walk around the classroom and make sure students aren't looking at their phone or something like that. But there are a lot of advantages to online testing. And even though the academic dishonesty slash honesty, we hope, is a challenge and it's something that's going to take a long time and some creativity to really work through, it just has great potential. And I think that that's going to be one of the uh, jewels, one of the things that we're going to want to keep. And that's really, if you think about it, that's one of the that's that's one of the ways in which societies grow and reach their potential and become better is by deciding and making good choices. What do we want to keep, and what do we want to replace with something something new? Yeah, and, and hopefully, hopefully that can, I guess, open up opportunities to more people is, is how I would phrase it, right? Yes. So we, we do have a great question from a member of the audience. It says, as a society, we've shown a reluctance to address policy options towards issues facing certain segments of the population for fear of a pushback. So how, so the question is, how can we address the pre-existing inequities given this reluctance to address issues head on? Because I guess somebody might say, well, it's a special benefit. Um, and others may say it's it's leveling the playing field. So we always have that that kind of discussion in the, the policy political side of things anyway. That's that's actually a pretty challenging question. And, and I think it's important because the reality is that where we are today in this country, uh, we are quite divided. And without getting into the politics of, you know, who believes this and who believes that and who says this is the right policy and the direction that we should go, we know that there are a lot of divisions and tensions and they're real. And so in thinking about the policies that will help us solve some of the most critical problems, I think a couple of things are important. 
One of them is that we have got to continue to hold up the banner of teaching what we believe to be the truth and teaching students to be critical thinkers so that they don't grow up to be folks who will just take anything at their word, right? Or people who are viewed, who are interested only in their own interest or the interest of what, what they see as the interest of their group. It's not, that's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge. And I think it's going to be a challenge because we have gone so far in the direction of everything being put, so many things being put as either or, right? So I think education is critical, right? Knowing our history, knowing where we, know, knowing how we got here is really important. It's not that everyone is going to agree once we know how we got here but at least people will have a view that's informed. Absolutely. It's armed with knowing, knowing how we got here, right? And, and I think this zero sum view of the world is, is part of what we're really struggling, part of what we're really struggling with here. Absolutely. I, I mean, one of my favorite, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go serious nerdy nerd here, but one of my favorite essays that I've ever written that I think is most thoughtful, thought-provoking, is Max Weber's Science as a Vocation. And, and one of the prime things you're supposed to do as a scientist, whether you're a social scientist, and I'm going to pivot to one of our questions here, maybe a medical researcher, is, is inconvenient facts right, is you have to look at those inconvenient facts, facts that are inconvenient for your preference, for your beliefs, for, for something you view as settled, is you have to be open to that. Um, and he also talks about, you know, the needing to be aware of your blind spots. There are certain things that I just don't see right. be easily because of my experience, right? We all have them. Yeah, we all have them. We definitely do all have them. Um, so one of one of the the audience members was was very much struck by what you mentioned about clinical trials, um, and you know just also remarking that women's health issues are not as studied or understood, and then often doctors just say, "Hey, try hormone therapy," right? <laughs> I don't know about you, that scares me, you know, like what are the long-term consequences of this if right. it's not your natural state? Um, do you do you want to comment any further on on some of those issues or disparities? Sure, I will. Let me let me first say that I have studied disparities in economic status, workforce, uh, educational attainment, and not in the sphere of where those clinical trials belong. So as my daughter liked to say, when she was much younger, she would say, mom, you're not the kind of doctor who can help people. So let me be very clear about that. I don't wanna step into an area in which I is not my area of expertise. What I do know about is access to resources and that socioeconomic status matters where you live matters. The new terminology for that is zip code. You know, zip code, zip code matters. And so I think the, the, I think the real important point to be made here uh, is not that I'm making a clear statement about um, racial differences or gender differences or equity issues in the health field, but that things like we know that women who have symptoms that are similar to or associated with cardiac arrest, different types of heart related episodes, it's been shown that doctors don't always take women as seriously as they do men when women come with certain types of, of concerns. Okay, so where, where, am I, where am I going with all of this? It's all about resources at the end of the day. And so we need to pay attention to how resources in government agencies like the NIH, NIH just issued a huge statement a couple days ago, uh, last week, 
about racial differences in biomedical research that went as far as an apology, I might add, <laughs> right? That's a big deal, right? That's a really big deal. Now, I'm not saying we wanna put all of our emphasis in that one area, but to the degree that investments in health matter for a lot of other things, then we, we, need, we, need, to, we need to pay attention to that. I am heartened by seeing that I, I believe I perceive a new type of leadership being developed in which people coming from a lot of different perspectives, I'm not just talking about racial and gender diversity, but people coming from different perspectives in terms of their expertise and their educational background, being brought into leadership positions is very, very positive. Right, because we're going to get some some of that interaction that I talked about. Health matters for education, matters for family issues, matters for childbearing, all of those things. Right. Um, we do know that one of the things we learned as a country through the COVID-19 pandemic was about socioeconomic and racial differences in access to health care and in health conditions. So when the news first broke that the African-American community was being hardest hit by the COVID pandemic or, or the coronavirus is a better way to say it, that not only were African-Americans more likely than whites to contract COVID, but once they became ill, they were more likely to die from it, okay? Having studied racial differences in economic status for the amount of time that I've studied, that came as no surprise to me. Now, as I said, the medical side of things is not my expertise, but I know enough about it to know that issues like diabetes, obesity, heart disease are more prevalent in the African-American community and they are connected to economics. That's really all you needed to understand the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the African-American community. So we've got to be willing to dig a little bit deeper to try to address some of these, whether you want to call it inequity, inequalities, differences, whatever language you want to put on it, that where you live, as I said, where you live matters, where you were born matters, whether your parents went to college, all of those things matter to the quality of people's lives and the opportunities to which they have access. Well, I think the amount of politics can change that. It's just the reality of the way that our country works. So knowing that <laughs> should help us to inform public policy. It's really not that complicated, right? Let's put the social science and the policy together. That's what we're. That's what we're good for. That's what. That's what we do at EPBS, right? That's that's that, right. That, it, that is our that is our calling, right? And data so, driven decision making. Absolutely. And yeah. you know, on that line, we do have we have a great question from the audience again is asking, are there two ones? I hope we can get both of them. I'll start with one. So, you know, in all your research on on some of these disparities, how does Texas compare to other states? You know, because we have experimentation of different policies at the state level. And I guess I would broaden that out. How do you view the U.S.? Have you looked at it comparatively, the U.S. versus other countries on 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 trying to address some of these disparities in 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 women's uh, for working women or women's yeah. professional achievement? I have not looked at I have not looked at other countries. You know, I know a little bit about Latin America from having studied Latin America, which feels now like in another life, but I, but I did. Um, and I think that because the cultural context is so different, the economic context is so different, uh, it's really hard to make these types of comparisons. And it's not always easy for the United States to learn from other countries or to follow models from other countries because we're pretty unique. We're pretty unique. We're, I mean, we're the only country in the world where people have come, people have backgrounds from all over the world. And so while our diversity is at once an asset, it also raises, it also raises, raises challenges for us. So I don't know about 
so much comparing the, if you're talking about health or the COVID-19, specifically with that, was that question about the COVID-19? I, I think this one was more just uh, promoting success for women in, in the workplace. Oh, okay, about promote, okay. So no, that I don't know much about. I don't know much about what other countries, uh, what other countries have done. As far as comparing Texas to other states, I have to go back to investment in education because that's really that's really where it all starts, right? This issue of girls and math is still huge. Girls and science, it's still huge. There's still that dropping off that happens with girls around junior high school from math and science because it's just not cool to be a girl who's good at math. And I know because <laughs> so many years back there that I feel like I can't see back that far. You know, <laughs> I was that I was that not so cool girl who was good at math, right? And it was an issue. <laughs> and girls care about that when they're 13 and 14 and things like that. Okay, so I think one of the things that we really have to grapple with with, the, with our state is where we show up on some of these lists. And what list am I talking about? I'm talking about poverty among women. I'm talking about child poverty. I'm talking about per pupil spending on education. I'm talking about investment in health and education for children. It's that foundation that we really need to work on that at this point, I would argue, is maybe even more important than developing specific programs that are going to help women move forward. I might be wrong about that, but they're certainly as they're certainly as important. OK, so yes, we're an educational institution and it sounds self-serving for me to say <laughs> invest in education. But really and truly, until we get the public to understand that investing in education goes beyond the benefits for the individuals who graduated from high school or for who graduated from college. And if we want to sit down at the table and have a conversation about the kind of society we want to have and what we want the next 20, 50, 100 years to look like when we're no longer here, education has to figure. Education has to figure. And equality in education, whatever that means, has, has, has to be in that conversation because it is the, it is the foundation, right? So I would say Texas wake up, right? Wake up, great state of Texas, because you know that old phrase, wake up and smell the coffee burning, right? The coffee's burning in some places in our state. And in fact, I had my students a couple of weeks ago when we came back from the winter storm, I said, we're going to kind of ease back into it, right? We read an article about the great potential that Texas has as a state in terms of its economic growth and development. And some of the factors and limitations, some of the obstacles that could possibly limit our growth, economic growth and development. And that came out of what happened with the winter storm. Yeah. So that's another silver lining, difficult though it was. We learned some lessons and we learned some truths about how some things are set up. And what I'm so happy about is the younger generation, you know, Dean Holmes, our students and those who will be our students in, in years to come for however long I last, right? They are unafraid. And, and it's, a, it's just a beautiful thing, right? They're unafraid of digging deep to figure out what caused some of these issues. My students asked me, well, Dr. McElroy, what happened with the power grid? I said, I'm gonna read up on it just like you do, right? But to know that policy is often the link to things being better the next time around gives me hope and encouragement because we have a we have a new generation coming along that's not afraid to take a hard look at those problems and they're not afraid to roll up their sleeves and try and figure out what are we going to do to make this better. Well, I think that's I'm teaching them. <laughs> Yeah, as do I. That's the the worst thing about being dean is not being in the classroom. I'll tell you that. Well, I think 
we should probably end on that note of we optimism. Um, and I agree with you. I, I, you know, our students, they're, they're not, you know, they, they, they're looking at the future. They're not looking at the past and, and they, they do want to, to think differently and make things better. And we will all benefit from that. So thank you so much for joining us today. You're this so is welcome. It's my pleasure, Dean Holmes. Well, this is, you know, it is, it is Women's Month and we just did, you know, Imagine a Scientist yesterday. And so this was a perfect complement to that programming. I really appreciate you, you taking the time to chat with us today. And I will say we had spectacular attendance.